This is John Mutter. What is your official role? Enterprise Mobility Architect. Do you want to drive this? Uh, you can okay. drive that's fine. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit today about, it says deep dive there, but there's a number of topics to, to cover. These are going to be kind of like seeds, so you can go and try and find out more information. Um, as of yesterday, if you haven't gone and taken a look at our download sections for our tooling, there's a bunch more uh, information about all the API you're going to see here today. There's um, a ton of documentation and um, everything you'll need to know that you, if you get inspired here a little bit, you can find online. Okay? So uh, I guess we'll get started. Okay, files and file system. So as boring as it sounds, right? It's important. You know, if, it, if you take a look at mobile devices where they've been in the last while, mounting of a file system from your device when you plug it in or when you actually want to try and write to it, it's not always been as easy as you'd say as like on a, on a Unix or a Linux machine. Right? We're harnessing the power of QNX, and QNX itself being highly performant and maintaining a great file system, you're going to be able to write and redo it the way you've always done in the past. So you need a file system because you need to store data. Data, data, more data. And it's no big surprise your app is going to need some data here and there. I'll just let people get settled in. Did we close the doors a little too early? So when you're building applications, right, we're going to focus primarily on Cascades and native here today. Um, WebWorks and the Android, they've got their own information to be, to be shared. So that's where we're going to go with today. Because one, if you haven't noticed, the majority, like a good portion of this show is getting really excited about the fact that with BlackBerry 10, Cascades and that Cascades integration is kind of really front and center. Do you want to say something about Pruner? I do. I got to tell you, we're going to completely shake things up and we're going to give you two options for storage. So it used to be you just had one file system that was available to you and it was all you could use. But now there's an enterprise filing system and then there's a personal filing system. And these are important, especially if you plan to target enterprise developers or consumers. That's right. So, I mean, I'm not sure, show of hands, who here is an enterprise application developer? You work for a company, you make enterprise apps, okay. Right, so this is the kind of thing that's gonna to matter to you. The rest of you, I assume, are either hobbyists or, or make good consumer apps? Show of hands, okay, perfect. The people in the green shirt obviously haven't raised their hands at all. I'm suspicious uh, of them. I'm just suspicious of them too. I am. So, we've got files and we've got databases. Right? There's no need for them to fight, they can coexist. Our file system is laid out in such a way that you can actually have a, a database directory structure. You get a file system directory structure. The apps have your ability to read and write from folders. There's some caveats there. We'll go through those in a little bit. You can create files and folders. Again, that's the read and write business. Who's clicking? Is that me? I think it's the door. OK. Um, you can create databases, make queries, and retrieve data from a server on a network. Now, that one's kind of like, you know, you just open up a HTTP stream. And Get your files. Love it. BlackBerry Balance. Oh, yeah. Who's, who's heard of BlackBerry Balance? I have. Excellent. That's good. Most people raise their hands. BlackBerry Balance is really game changing for us on this new platform moving forward. Uh, being able to create a persona on the device that can suit the need of your user is, is very, very important. So, from a work perspective, we want, we want enterprises to be able to hook up this device to their infrastructure. And, and do what they need to do to feel secure, confident, and in control of their data, right? Password protect it, control what applications are installed on it, control the behavior, take charge of the file system. We also want you to be able to have Angry Birds or, you know, your choice of games, apps, and, and other entertainment pieces as well. And they need to be separate. Right? Because the second you put that stuff on the enterprise side, the enterprise guys are like, no, you can't do that, you can't do this. And, and, and the second it's all, you know, just personal uh, use. That's right. right. Uh, maybe you want to touch on a little bit about how like, enterprise is going to be able to deploy that. Do you have any information on that? Think we sure? do. The, uh, the enterprise app world, we'll get to that in just uh, okay. the very next slide. But basically what happens is the device itself has two separate actual storage locations that it uses. The enterprise side, the personal side, we'll call it work personal, all right? On the work filing system, you will install your applications, use file space, 
you share data space that's all aligned with the work perimeter. All right, we have some rules that are in there, right? Work applications can access work data and view only personal data, so they can only view that personal data. They have the ability to attach personal files to your work emails, but you can't necessarily, uh, right, grab work stuff and put it into your personal. Uh, you can access intranets, right, Blackberry Bridge, corporate VPNs, or Wi-Fi, but you cannot access work data from your personal perimeter, and you cannot attach work files to your personal assets. So there's a, there's a control mechanism that takes place of the files moving across the file system. Um, with that, with the enterprise app world that we make available, the only way to get an application into the enterprise perimeter or the work perimeter is to actually deploy it from BlackBerry Device Service. So you're managing your applications on this, you know, next generation type BEZ, right? And as you put that stuff out there, this is a term I shouldn't have used, right? Nope. As you put that stuff out there and deploy it through that BlackBerry Enterprise Server product, um, it is then officially deployed into the work perimeter. It's the only way to get it there. You can't sideload apps into the work perimeter. You can't just like slip them in. The only way to get them there is to actually deploy them from the enterprise through that, through that BDS interface. That's right. So let's say I, I decide in my enterprise app world I want to mark Facebook available for all my users. Hmm. From that point forward, Facebook lives in the enterprise perimeter. That, that instance of Facebook. That's instance of Facebook. Right. You could have a secondary instance in, the, in your personal side. Which is right. in the personal side of it, because they're completely separate file structures. If that, everyone's kind of following where I'm going with that. Does anybody here use BlackBerry Bridge on their playbook to bridge with their BlackBerry? So you know how you've got, you go into Bridge, you've got another copy of your messages folder, your calendar, your browser? Just like that. That's kind of like the, the genesis of the BDS and the, the splitting of the personal and work. This, this becomes more prevalent as you start to work with shared data folders. So let's say I, I'm putting documents into my shared folders that I want to be able to make available to, to my users. Um, if I put it in while I'm using a personal app, the enterprise app would be able to view it. But if I put it in while it was a work app, personal apps would not be able to get access to it. Does that make sense? Any questions? Any questions? Yes. Sure. That's correct. So the, well, we'll repeat the question. So don't come up to the mic. Oh, sorry. So, uh, so for, the recording, for the recording later on, um, the question was, if in the instance of like Facebook, if you had it in the work perimeter and you had it in the consumer perimeter, is it two separate installs? And the answer is yes. It actually stores all the files and its corresponding file structure and all those things it has access to inside of its respective perimeter. So if it's not in the right place, you need two copies to use it in both instances. Are there any features on it that would prevent the business side from seeing the personal side? Yeah, I don't know right off the top of my head. I can get back to you on that, which, uh, which policies and how far they extend there. There are policies that restrict behavior, but does it ex explicitly do that? I can't tell you off the top of my head. Another question? How much space is allocated and can you customize that? Um, Elena, yeah, Dave, do you guys know? How much space per app? What's no, the maximum? I, I, yeah, we don't have, we don't have a quota on there, so you, there's no limit to the size of the application space. It can shift and move around as it goes. It's all total space, right? It's like one big disk, but it's, it's permission controlled, so we don't really have quotas. Yes? Can an application that was installed via Enterprise App World install a other applications into the work perimeter? The no. answer is no. No, so all your applications, we'll get to this in a second, is all your applications, whether work on the work side of the perimeter or on the personal side of the perimeter, all your applications have their own sandbox. Right? That sandbox dictates where the application is stored, where the data is stored, where the logs are stored, where the database is stored, Which and the we'll, assets. We'll get into that yeah. structure of what all that is in this presentation. Wait. Yeah, we're not, you know, as you're going to see over the course of the next, you know, starting as of like February all the way up till now, the goal is never to have um, API, like 100% code coverage of the same API. It's a new platform, we're doing things a little bit differently. So yeah, we're, 
we're making sure that we stay sandboxed. So you, uh, you can't create your own app loader, for instance, if that's what you wanted to do, which I assume is what you're trying to do, or maybe do like feature upgrades. You'd have to use App World to be able to push a new version down. Right. But the software di distribution mechanisms side of Enterprise App World would really make it easy to manage those changes and the ability to install those changes without all the reboots we've had to deal with inside of Java. Yeah, it's actually a good point. Yeah, do you want to clap that one? Oh, I, yeah. I was open. Slow Please. clap. Yeah, slow clap. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. So we'll go back to the file system a little bit here. And like I said, there's a data directory, there's an assets directory, there's um, a DB directory, there's a log directory, there's a temp directory, and there's a shared folder. Okay. There's an app folder as well. Some of these folders you have access to write to, you have access to read to, but not all of them. Okay. For instance, the app directory. You don't have access from your application to write into that. Because in there, as I kind of showed off here, right? So the sandboxes, this is what it kind of looks like. I'm not sure if this screen is still valid. This was from another slide deck we had. Um, is, if, is it still looks the same? Okay. So um, you can write to the temp file folder. It's a really good idea when you're writing to the temp folder to clean it up as you go. Because if you don't, then cascades will come along or Blackberry, you know, the operating system will come around and clean it up when it feels like it wants to. Um, you can write to the data directory. Obviously, that's where you'd write files. Um, the DB directory is exclusively for use for SQLite. And the logs directory is where standard error and standard out go. So files are still cool, right? Right? Still cool. <laughs> File pointer, F open, read, write permissions, F close. Right? It doesn't have to be any more, it doesn't have to be more complicated than that. Right? The SDK, our native SDK is built based on top of you know, standard, standard C, standard uh, C++. Dinkum. With uh, Qt, there's obviously, you know, when you throw in a C++ framework on top, they're going to have their Q file. And that's how you would access it. Q file kind of reminds you of the way you would use, you know, um, C++ IO streams. So you, you redirect your out input and your output through those. Just a text file. What is this? Dude, where's my file? Oh, yes. Okay, so Cascades also provides you with some static methods that are part of the QDIR class. Okay, this comes from the QT core. And effectively, with current path, that's going to bring you to where the application's running. It's kind of the root level system. Um, home path, that's going to be where your data directory is. All right, so that's that. if I go back to right here, is that data directory? What does the later work? The data directory there. And uh, temporary path, obviously the temp folder. So again, not all, access, uh, not all the directories are accessible. For those of you trying to take pictures and trying to capture all this, it's all available on our developer. OK, you're not going to bother? <laughs> OK. Um, and the dollar home environment variable, now you can see you know, this is kind of where you know, that using QNX as that operating system really kind of comes home, right? It's like developing on any other platform. Just it works better. Um, you got logs. So shared directories, this is kind of be where we're going to spend a little bit of time here. So you have to set, in your, in your configuration file, you have to set the access shared permission level. And what shared folders are for, this is kind of used by all your applications. So let's say you're making like an image viewer, right. you're capturing images, and you want to be able to upload those via Facebook. Well, you could throw those images either into the camera folder, as it comes right off the camera, or into the pictures folder, and that's shared. And that's your personal. That shared folder is also protected from the perimeter, over the perimeter. Right, so you're going to have a shared folder in the perimeter. You're going to have a shared folder in right. the consumer space. And the, the real benefit there is that enterprise apps can have the, yes, I love it. I meant to fire the guns. Um, enterprise apps can have their own space as well, which is really great, because if you think about an enterprise, let's say they want to they promulgate out a disaster recovery plan, right? Propagate out that plan. And so the app is syncing documents with the device. You can actually write those to the shared space, and I can literally go and look at the, the PDFs or the, or the PowerPoints right there inside of the device's native file viewers because it, it's synced onto the device and is stored on the device as well in that shared space. So I don't necessarily have to be in the app to view the documents that are there. And I can, you know, if I uninstall the app or, or if you've lost privileges, I can remove files from that shared space as well if I've set the appropriate permissions 
so that uh, my corporate right. resources can be taken out. And you can do that in the personal space, too. So it's not rocket science, right? It kind of makes sense when you see it and you hear it. If you need more information, you take a look. Okay, Jason, not Jason, all right? Jason owes me money. Yeah, he does, actually. Does he owe you money? No, no, he paid up last night. So it's a streamlined data structure. Right? This allows you to do easily share. Who remembers back when people were using XML oh. as being the transport mechanism for data and like configuration? You're looking at, you're like, why do we need a file that is like 40 pages long to have a Hello World app? Right? You don't need that, right? So JSON kind of came along and solved that for us. It's based on the idea of two fundamentals. Things are organized in arrays and then as objects. Right? So who here doesn't know what JSON is? I'm not going to put you on blast. Okay. Anyone we could ridicule? Anyone? Put like, you on the spot? The guy over there Make playing with his new dev alpha. <laughs> 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 All right, so it looks like that. Right? If you haven't seen it before, it looks like that. Value, pair. Curly braces, square brackets. Okay, so cascades. It's MVC, baby. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it all is. day long. So model view controller. Anybody not know what a model view controller paradigm is? Anyone? Okay, we're good. And we're done. Thanks. Thanks for coming up. All right. Well, hey, great. <laughs> no. All right. So yeah, it really was. So we've got two classes that we've made up. Well, actually, there's three classes. So we'll get to that. But right here, there's two of the dynamic duo. Data access and data model. Cas this is kind of like the basis of, you know, those when you're seeing the demos yesterday on, on um, the keynote, and like all of a sudden there's these beautiful list views and super fast scrolling. That's all being made usable by these data models, this data access. The, so uh, had, oh, go ahead. the Cascades library itself really excels at those large data sets. So you know, maybe if you've worked in some of the in some of the web technologies where you're working with those large data sets, you, you have to kind of load some stuff and then let the scroll happen and then unload some stuff and load some more stuff and, and do all this stuff. And it, and, and it affects the performance as you're scrolling through these big lists. And Cascade just, Cascade just takes that stuff and... Yeah, actually, it does, it, does, it does do lazy loading. It loads what it needs what it needs to. But it seems to do it pretty, pretty oh, fast. Oh, no, lightning fast. Yeah. So data access. Oh, data models first, obviously. We can lose the data access. We did. Okay. <laughs> data access. Data access is the class basically that plugs directly into your external data source. So that's like your file or a database. And I've got some examples of those, kind of like code snippets to show you. And that's what sucks in your data, right? That's what is kind of the, the first piece that holds on to your data. So once you create a connection to your data access, your data access piece, so it's either like an SQL data access, JSON data access, they'll suck it in. From there, it goes on to a data model. The data model effectively tells the, what's going to eventually be a list view how to interpret the data that was just brought in, how to, um, how to assign that Apply to, it, yeah, to what's effectively... The, it, it, it makes uh, a dynamic class out of it, effectively, a dynamic object out of it. Sorry, dynamic objects out of it. And everything is of a type called Q variant. And Q variant is kind of like this generic type, and it, try to figure, it tries to figure out the type as it goes. So there's a lot more in there, and we don't have that in here, but I just wanted everybody to know that through JSON, you kind of lose your object information. Right? You lose, you don't have any static members in there. You, don't have, you just have data, value, and pair. So these variants are kind of like these generic objects that can um, hold on to your data. And one thing to, to remember about this data access data model, this is for that viewable. This is for like your Cascades application right. and not like your straight up, just straight up C++ application. Like if you were building a first person shooter, you wouldn't use Cascades. So it makes sense that if you weren't using Cascades, you wouldn't be doing it this way. You probably also wouldn't have a thousand record list view. You probably wouldn't, no. Um, so you can create your own data models if you wanted. Okay, out of the box, there's three. There's the XML data model, JSON data model, and SQL data model. But you can create your, more, your own. You can extend data model to whatever suits your need. Um, list views. So list views are kind of like the last piece. They're the view that completes the model view controller of, um, of this system. And list views bind themselves to a data model. A data model must be bound to a data access piece. And once that binding happens, the three interact. And what is happening is a list view has the ability to control and go back into the data and uses that seamlessly. 
The great thing about that is there's not a ton of plumbing that you have to do. Okay, so it really is easy. Um, very simply, you create a new model, you point it at your data, you load it up, and see there you come up with this Q variant list, context JSON. So it strips out from that load. That load calls comes out and strips out into this, this variant pointer, effectively. Well, that's not a pointer. Um, and then you just insert it into the list, and you're good to go. Is there any questions about that? We're gonna, there's a little bit more of that that comes when we go into the databases, but is there any questions right there? Anybody confused? No? Everybody's still awake? All right, anybody other than Martin still awake? You were um, talking about getting all these great pictures in the photos. I know, I know. Let's get him to come up closer. I just like it. Um, so SQLite, QTSQL, and Cascades API. So there's three different ways of effectively accessing a database on the platform. The important thing to remember is it's all SQL Lite. You can access it in different ways for when it, it suits your purpose. And we'll kind of go over that a little bit. You know, you don't always need to use these data access pieces. But remember, it's always SQL Lite. Oh, I'm gonna back up a little bit. Down there I put this note just a few minutes ago in the bottom of this one. Is that SQL Lite is not the only open source project that we've attached to the platform and to the NDK. Um, if you take a look, there's more documentation for it, but they're, one of the great things about our native developer kit is that you can go and find a package that you like using online or something you might be contributing to in the open source, and you can take that in and just easily port it. It's all standard C and C++. Okay. So LibSQLite, it's the base model. If you're writing in C, if you're right up, straight up writing in C, no C++, I don't know what you'd be building. Um, I can't even think of a really good example of that because we don't allow background services. You could use LibSQL. Effectively, you're probably going to use S uh, Qt SQL. Let's say you had um, another like you know 3D 3D game, and you for some reason wanted to use a database. There's a time when you might just plumb straight to to LibSQL like. Okay. Um, Qt SQL code. Okay, so. Here's what's gonna get a little weird, a little tricky. Trying to pay, t pay attention to the, the signature here. This Q in front, that Q in front kind of tells you that it comes from the Qt core, the stuff that we brought in from Qt. Okay, so I say Qt and Qt interchangeably. I apologize, but um, I do. I do it too. Yeah, and so this one here is really what we're doing is we're using Qt SQL. Qt SQL is a C++ wrapper interface that allows you to use uh, libsql with, and uh, related objects. And this is just a simple way of how you'd get connected to a database. Once again, it's the MVC model, right? So we've got external data, got a data model, data, sorry, data access, data model, list view. It applies to JSON database access. Cascades here, you've got SQL data access. This is a prime example of how you'd use an SQL data access piece. If you take a look, there's no Q in front of that S for the SQL database access. That gives us an idea. Where are we? Cascades. Right, there's going to be a quiz. I'm not sure. Did you tell them about the quiz? I did. No. Uh, okay. We're locking the doors. Now. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Um, so this is how you'd access it, right? So you create an SQL data access. Right at the top there, you've got, you know, you've got your model, you've got your access, and then you're binding it to a list view. Right, that seems pretty simple for all that plumbing, right? You've just pointed a JSON file to it, the data. And the next thing you know, you've got an application that scrolls. You've got a list view that scrolls. Does anybody have an idea of how, how much code that would have taken like in the old MFC days? Now, has anybody created an ODBC driver before? Yeah. That's a ton of work. You had a question? Yes. Um, we can put something together like that and attach it afterwards. Um, do you have a way of writing this down? Yeah, I brought a pen. Hold on. Can you come up afterwards and remind me? I'll keep going through. Remind me and I'll put it in my BlackBerry. Yeah. And then uh, what we'll do is we'll attach um, kind of like a, a deeper sample in it. Okay, question? Uh, 
Um, you can create the DB file. It, you Hold on. It's, I think, it's, do we, do we, okay, you can create the DB file effectively. I'm not sure if I've got a snippet of code that shows that, but you can create, delete, add, remove. Yeah. yeah just typical, typical CRUD, right? So you've got access to SQLite just by including the include. It, it, it and creating really, instance, sorry. It really is, you know, very, very simple form of SQL. It's, it's quite elegant in nature, and it has all the sophistication that you want. And it's one of the reasons why they've chosen SQLite is so that you have all of that capability available to you. So I, I get that sometimes the samples we give are just really, really simple because we don't want to, you know, bury them, you know, bury the, the detail into, uh, into complex samples so you can just kind of see the concept of what it is. But, yeah, basic SQLite stuff here applies, and it's very scalable and extremely fast. What, what about error handling? So um, go back to the sample real quick. Yeah, the if OK. One more right there. OK, so, so because of the size of this code, I actually cut out the error piece, the, the else to that true. We, we just threw in that, that little bool there to kind of show that, yeah, we thought about error handling for a second. But um, I mean, obviously, obviously if you're, you're developing one of your apps, you're going to put a lot more time and effort. And in reality, you know, we only have so many lines that we can put in there for the sample to be readable. But uh, yeah, there's, there's plenty of error handling, and you have a, a great place inside of your, your file structure available to you where you can put your standard, in, your standard outs, right, in that, in that log folder. So uh, we've given you a lot of capability to be able to, to put stuff in there <coughs> and work with it. So. Keep talking. <laughs> where are we at? I just keep on going. Hide the remote. So okay. I'm just writing down those, those things. I'll, I'll get air handling stuff attached on here as well in the Q, the Q variant, more detailed sample. So here's another Cascades uh, list view sample that he's kind of showing as we move through that MVC model. But you know, we, we attached all of our samples and talks to list view. There's obviously lots of different things that are available to you inside of Cascades. Uh, the general point is, you, with your data model, you define what you're expecting to get back from that return, from whatever that query is that you, you've submitted. And then you use your standard loop to be able to parse through it and put the stuff into the into the list view, whatever, whatever view it is you're putting up there. Yeah, well, the question that earlier about a more detailed example is that they come in as generic Q variants, yeah. like getting the proper type set up. Right. So, so we're getting close to the end here. So take away, right, it's like delicious food. Right? Files are simple, file structure is easy, it doesn't have to be complicated, just go and do it. Data can be stored, content can be shared, you know, there's private information is safe, whole kit and caboodle. Stuff to remember, SQLite's the base of all the database stuff. Um, LibSQLite, if you're gonna do like a straight inclusion of, the, of, of that, that header, if you're gonna write via C or maybe even C++, that's what you'd use. We, we did recommend write the Qt SQLite, Qt SQLite as your method for C++, highly recommended. Typically when people on stage say highly recommended, it means don't do it the other way, right? Oh, your hubs are gratuitous, kitten. They didn't strip it. No. I they love didn't. it. So, um, <laughs> C, C, for, for C++ data access, you've got your cute SQL. And then for Cascades, remember with Cascades, you're not going to see the little Q in front, and that gives you your data, data access. Right, so SQL data access. And gratuitous kitten picture. Oh, this is a wonderful thing, isn't it? Yeah. That's beautiful. It's like the best part of the slide, though. And so let's talk more. Okay. Join the round table for the session. Oh, there's a round table at 6 p.m. in the exhibit. So come to that. Um, before 6 p.m., I'll try and get some answers to um, more detailed uh, how to handle Q variants. And um, if you want to hit Twitter, you can use uh, jam19, at partypat, or uh, what's yours? Mutta Joe. Mutta Joe. M-U-T-T-E-J-O. And uh, all right, just leave that up there. So don't forget those. You can download those afterwards, and who here has done the 10K Reasons to Believe? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, including at least one RIM employee, seven, eight, <laughs> perfect. So that means the other 44 of you, um, I think you should probably just go stand in line now. The line will be long because there's 44 of you, so you might want to get through it quickly. What, was there anything that you were hoping we were going to touch on today that we didn't in this you know, very brief amount of time that we had? 
Is there something that we should have we should have said? Oh man, okay. Perfect. Good. Let's go. In, okay, in the back. So as we're gonna do this, let's come up to the microphone for them, just so we don't have to repeat them all. And we can record it, yeah. So if you got questions, if you're if you're too shy to stand at the mic, Hi. you can't ask. I'm Michael. Them. I'm working with Cascades. Hi, and Michael. Really, hi. hi, Michael. Yeah. I was trying to get a little more information on how to create custom list views and how to handle uh, multi-dimensional JSON data that's coming in from my server and putting that into a custom list view. Yeah, so, so when, we, when we get into a better discussion of like how the Q-variant list is, is managed, yeah. um, we'll tackle that. So come to the round table. All right, and I'll, I'll have an answer for you then. There, there is something. To be, there is something to be said, though, that when you're sharing data and when you're bringing data into an application, you have to remember the parameters of your application, right? So it'd be, it's really easy to like poke holes into something that may not have, you know, all all the, the strict JSON rules you want, but at the end you're still trying to display that on a screen. So you know, being a little bit more optimized in the way you organize your data on the way in. Not, not always, no. But that's where you can extend the Q model, right. the, the data model of your own. So by structuring your own data model, you might be able to handle some more of that. Um, I don't know for sure, though. That's, that's like a whole other topic that yeah. we could do, though, creating the, the data model all by itself, right? I mean, that's a, that's a big topic that we could tackle. Question? Uh, yeah. For example, if I have an application that has SQLite and I do an update for my application, how yeah. does it handle? Do I need to care about uh, saving the user's data? or? Is the framework able um, to providing the update your application? Do either of you know if an, up, an update just goes in the same spot over top yeah. of it? It overwrites, update right? The application, the data, data folder is saved. It's saved. It's either an installed application or is it the Right, okay. so the update is different than an uninstall. But right. You need to watch, like, if you're doing SQL and you change. Yeah, I was going to say, if you change your, your schema. schema. Mm -hmm. You need to make sure that you have some sort of backwards compatibility. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, so I was, was going to say, so get on the recording. Yeah, good. yeah so um, Elena mentioned that the answer there is that if you do an uninstall of your application, that the data is removed. If you do an update, then it's saved. And further that, again, if you change your schema, if you change the schema of your data in the database, make sure you have something that's backwards compatible, right? And fi have a way of being able to port your, your data forward. Who here has ever used like WordPress? WordPress for a data site? Yeah. You know how often WordPress changes their format. <laughs> how many times? Who here, other than myself, has lost an entire database? They, from they do it for sport. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah, Anyone from WordPress today? Yeah. <laughs> because right now, uh, for example, if I do it, uh, if I push an update to my uh, device using ID, for example, it wipes everything. So, for you example, say, if I am it? doing a Notepad Sorry, application saying, and I add notes and I compile again and I uh, deploy it on the device, it wipes. Everything. So the data is not there. Which which device are you referring to, sir? Uh, playbook. Playbook. Yeah. It depends how you have your launch configuration set up in okay. the IDE, but you can configure it so that it doesn't it uninstall or clean the data folder right. when it installs it. Again. Okay. But for like the typical app world upgrade scenario, mm -hmm. all the data folder is maintained between upgrades. Oh, okay. Thanks. Awesome. Definitely come by and, and see us, and we'll, we'll talk more about that. Uh, for the enterprise file system, how are you securing files and keeping people from checking stuff out? It's all handled at the microkernel level. Okay. So it is it encrypted the, or? It controls the behavior. Uh, is it encrypted? Um, loaded question of the day. <laughs> uh, yes, there is a level of encryption that is applied. Okay. Are you able to say what kind? I, I honestly don't know what it is off the top of my head. So I... I it's not that I don't want to say. I just don't know what it is off the top of my head. I should know. AS-256. This, this is a DOD guy, so. Am I allowed to say that? No idea. It's too late now. Now I'm. You big, you need me big my better. helicopters are coming. Yep. Yep. What's the deal with the SD card? That's a loaded question. They're five, they're $5 at uh, the BlackBerry booth. Next question. Well played. Um, 
So you said there's second shared folder for enterprise apps. So when you so. plug in your device to uh, your computer, the normal shared folder is mounted as uh, Personal. like external. So what happened to the enterprise one? Would it's be mounted or? It's not visible to the USB drive. Okay, so it's, it's only um, application can write to it and see it. That's right. Okay. So desktop manager can't see it either? No. Okay. Question? Do we support memory map files? Yes. Don't know. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> no idea. They, th that's a level of information they don't share with guys like me. All right. It sure sounded cool, though. I'm going to tell you. The, the XFAT, it sounded cool. If I say from what I understand with XFAT, it's, it's for the future for our, like our next generation file system. It's basically you don't want to get sued. I can only assume. Ah. Sorry. Microsoft recently sued somebody re like really badly for that XFAT system. So I'm not sure who it was, but when they did, and our RIM legals on top of that kind of stuff, so. Hi. Um, oh, somebody using the microphone. Yeah. Clap. And, and yeah. wait, wait for it. Oh, and he's yes. got party, uh, party he's got pet. got the party pet, man. Yeah. Um, real quick, um, I'm not really familiar with uh, SQLite. What's the difference between that and, say, uh, actual um, MySQL or something? Actually, yeah, MySQL or MSQL it's or anything. Basically, it's, it's made, actually, you know, it's, it's, it's lighter. It's lighter. <laughs> <laughs> the, big, the, the big thing with MySQL Lite, or sorry, SQL Lite versus MySQL is that it's all stored in one flat file system yeah. as opposed to having distributed across, you know, yeah. And, and, yeah. So it's just, it's built for mobile devices and smaller plat footprint platforms. That guy. Right. It, you know, to your point, right, it's, it's really built for a single user interacting with it, not multiple users, and it doesn't need all that stuff to, to handle multiple read writes simultaneously. And what about, like, views and star proxies? So I can't hear when you speak into the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, what about views and star prox, other things that are typically, you know, part of that as well? Yeah. I guess. Yeah, okay. all your SQL commands, you know, pretty yeah, much are there. Just make it easier. Anything else? Yep. Okay. What? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else got a question? <laughs> <laughs> this is more fun. <clears throat> Can I tell if my application is running in the enterprise partition or the personal partition? I don't have any APIs that you could call that would tell you uh, specifically where you're at. Visually, you can see where it is. Uh, do you know of any APIs that would allow you to no, identify? Don't. I don't know of any. You don't. The application ID No, but he's saying we don't allow you to detect, detect which applications are running. Oh, which applications are running? Yeah, no. No, he, so over he asked if he had I any mean, way that he could own tell own. if his own app was running in enterprise or yes. personal perimeter. Oh. And I, I'm not aware of I'm not aware of any way to do that. That'd be an interesting thing that we should we should send up. Like you say, if you detected the, the the current home folder system. Yeah. So you could. That'd be kind of useful. Yeah. Depending on I don't know how, <laughs> I don't know how the enterprise file system is laid out, because I've never seen it actually, but <laughs> I can only imagine that the whole path would look different. There'd be something identifiable in the path. It's not like, there's no API to be able to detect where it is, but you could. Okay. It. It so, makes up enterprise. so if I if the only way to get something in the app in the enterprise partition is through App World, how the hell do I test this? Enterprise App World. So how so do I test this? Well, <laughs> well, you'd, yeah. Test first, you got to get a BDS server. Test, yeah, you, you want to handle right? this one? There you go. Yep. First, you got to get a BDS server. <laughs> all right. And get Come the see you get the free trial with the 20 cal license that gives you 90 days to check out BDS goodness, right? And then uh, you can activate your playbook against it, and enterprise activate your playbook against it, and, and get that MDSCS connection going. Because yes, we have MDSCS for uh, okay. random clapping connection service. You guys know good connection service, right? It's awesome. It, it extends your network identity behind the firewall to your enterprise apps, right? 
No VPNs, no complex stuff. You're just you're connected. Always on bi-directional VPN. It's awesome. You okay. heard of this? Feature request. So no, that's cool, right? But uh, that's the only way you get okay. in there is with the BDS. And then once it's in there, it's in there. All right, that's That's a cool feature request. Hey, Elena, I got any feature request for you? <laughs> uh, anything else? Okay. Anybody want to see more kitten? More kitten? That is a cute kitten. Just I typed in kitten computer. Perfect. Yeah. That's the first one. Uh, I would personally like to thank everyone here for coming out today and spend some time with us learning about the files. Structure. I hope that we met your expectations for what you want to get out of this, system, uh, this, uh, this session. Uh, feel free to stop and chat with us if there's anything else you'd like to discuss uh, and to come by and see us later on. Um, I'm based out of the Guadalupe room. You can come on by and stop and see us in the Enterprise Lab anytime you'd like. And uh, Pat? Well, I got the round table. Are you going to be at the round table at 6? Probably. Okay. So we have a round table at 6 where, in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and find the answer to some of these questions. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.